Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Sam Dykov Bids Live episode number 40, where we walk through small business solicitations together on Sam.gov and answer your questions along the way so that you too can start bidding and winning contracts on Sam.gov for your small business. Today, we will be reviewing four small business solicitations that have pulled up on Sam that we will be jumping into in just a second. But if you are new here and you don't want to miss future Sam.gov Bids Live episodes, Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you can ask your questions live on future streams. And if you do happen to be somebody who's recently registered your business in Sam.gov and you're looking to get started bidding, check out the link in the video description for our free resource, which was designed to support new government contractors in the space just like you guys. Now, if you are on with us live right now, let me know which state you are representing. And also, if this is the first live, you, you caught it, you made it. Let me know that this is your first live as well. And we will go ahead and give you a sneak peek now of what the bids are going to be that we're going to be going over on today's episode. So bid number one is going to be medical services on SciPy campus. Number two is going to be custodial services out of Limestone, Maine. Bid number three is going to be alarm system monitoring for Grand uh, Teton National Parks. At the number four, chimney inspections and cleaning for the GRCA. We'll dive more into all of those in just a few moments. For any of you who are brand new here, this is your first live, and you're not sure exactly how this works. The way that this works is I don't go through any of these bids ahead of time. That way I can bring them to you uh, raw and real and kind of unpolished. That way we can go through things together because that's really what it's going to be like when you do it on your own on sam.gov too. So I kind of want to mimic that uh, process that you go through as much as possible in the safe space, i.e. the show. And then also this is live. So feel free to ask your questions either about the bid we're going over or even about something that's going on in your business if you have questions. And what we do is we'll, we'll look at a bid and then we'll come check the chat for questions. And then we just bounce back and forth for about an hour. And that's how the show works. So let's go ahead and check in with our chat. We've got a lot of folks hanging out with us already. Mike Oliveira claiming the number one spot for today was first. Uh, thanks for being here, Mike, and congrats. You got the first spot for the day. We got HB God made it. Absolutely, you definitely made it to live. We have Miss Jones. Good to see you as well. Thanks for hanging out with us. Corey Morton out of Delaware. Awesome. MS Jones, South Carolina. First live as well. Awesome. Uh, HB Degat says, I normally listen on Spotify at work. That's actually really, really cool. Because what we do, any of you guys who don't know, I don't really uh, say it very often at all. But um, we do upload all of these episodes after we go live. Um, I do upload those up to Spotify. So if you're somebody who likes Spotify, um, go and find us on there. If you want to like listen while you're at work or uh, driving on the road or anything like that. Um, Mike Oliveira, service disabled veteran owned small business. What's going on? Looking to bid on set aside government contracts. Love it. Um, e. Allen out of North Carolina. And this is first time as well. Welcome. <laughs> JJ. All right. JJ. JJ is the first one to comment on, on the shirt. So JJ gets some credit here. Um, love the shirt, brother. Thank you so much. I wore it on the last episode and I'm wearing it today. So this is uh, the only second episode so far that I've been wearing it. But I got some shirts made and brought them in. That would be a nice way to kind of uh, tie in a bit of community feel, right? And just make it a bit a bit more fun. We got Kay hanging out with us from Colorado. First time as well. Welcome. Good to see you, Kay. Um, Biz Champ, Charleston, South Carolina. Welcome. Elsie Williams. Hello, hello. Out of Orlando. And uh, Mike, this is also his first time as well. Welcome, everybody. Um, we got lots more uh, as well. But we'll go ahead and segue now to our first bid. Keep it coming, though, and we'll come back to the chat in just a a little bit. So bid number one that we'll be diving into right now is medical services on SciPy campus. This is going to be um, Indian Education Acquisition Office. So out of the Department of the Interior, this bid is due uh, actually just in a couple of days. So this is probably going to be more of an example than something that you'll re realistically have time to go after. So this is due May 18th. Small business set aside, however, in the NAICS code is 621399 for um, miscellaneous health practitioners. So they're saying just in the description, medical nursing services only. And then for attachments, we have a solicitation, we have a wage termination, and we have a statement of work scope. So let's first get started with the solicitation document. 
So we're immediately hit with the SF-1449 form. And this is only 18 pages, so not a whole lot, but we do see what appears to be price and Clint hitting us. Appears to be a bit, I don't know, let's take a look at this. I'll also zoom in. It says nursing contract service, option year four. And then also item number 400. Um, did I miss something? Okay, I guess, okay. I guess they didn't put it on page two here. So let's back it up a little bit. Option year one. Okay, so we don't typically see this. This is why we kind of missed it on the first round. They're just putting these price and cleanse right in the body of the SF-1449 form, not even in the price and clean pages that we'll typically see after it, um, right on the SF-1449 form. So we're seeing a base period of June 15th of this year, not a base period, the entire POP. June 15th of this year, going through June 14th of 2028. Then they are breaking it down by, here is the base. So it'll go through June 14th of next year for option uh, for the base and then option year one will commence June 1st. So there's a little bit of a couple week, um, I don't know, they're saying the anticipated exercise date. So I guess they're only gonna exercise it a couple weeks in advance. Don't worry so much about that. Just be focused on the POP and also be focused on doing a good job on the contract so that the option year can even be executed. Um, but nursing contract service, nursing contract service, that is which each, each of these line items are reflective of arguably the same service, just year on year for option years one, two, three, and then where we started off here, option four. So base plus four nursing services kicking off mid June gives us a bit of context and a pretty good general idea of what's going on here. They are saying this is a request for quote, um, and they are referencing simplified acquisition procedures. So this is in alignment with simplified acquisition. It's going to be under 250K for the base plus option years. So we didn't really have an idea of, of how many nursing, but you know, nursing is, is not a cheap labor category, right? Um, how many nurses, uh, if this whole thing's going to be under 250K, it's, it's not going to be that large of a contract. Um, that's kind of narrowing our, our vision of this as well. Again, a repetition of the uh, base plus option years and the POP. And then here we're actually seeing a true pricing CLIN table broken out, not to exceed 2080. So it's going to be for one full-time person, uh, very likely. Could be for like two part-timers, but likely based on the way these hours looks, it's just going to be one person and, prop and, and the same person. Um, so let's see up here. SciPi is anticipating awarding a labor hours type contract for nursing services. The estimated number of hours to be worked is 1040 a year. However, using a labor hours type contract will give SciPi on the, the contractor the latitude to adjust the number of hours if needed, but will not exceed 2080. And again, it's important that we read that because this is a not to exceed number. They are saying the estimate is 1040. So, so half of that, which would be a part timer, right? But they're saying, hey, we're not going to exceed in case we need more than part-time hours. So we start to piece this puzzle together. I'm um, very easy, you know, table to fill out though. Um, just add up your base and options to calculate your grand total here. And arguably, just to be fair, because we do get this question fairly often, when they give us the same cleanse in multiple places, do we have to fill them out in multiple places? Okay. You can always ask contracting number one, anytime you have questions. Uh, and number two, it's not going to hurt you to do both. Um, number three, you could likely get away with filling out the pricing table here with the grand total. Um, but we would also want to rely on any directions, instructions that are given to us um, in the instruction offers or evaluation factors, um, any direction. But we do like to aim on the more of the safe side, the more conservative side, because why not? But you know, if it's just straight up missing and it's included on your price and cleanse and contracting was wanting it, they would, uh, they would reach out to you for that clarification more than likely. So this solicitation document is not very long. We are almost all the way through it. Instruction offers and evaluation factors. We did find this on page 17 of 18, all the way at the back. So they're saying, for the non-price factors, technical approach, the offer shall provide a brief overview of the company's capabilities, as well as the plan to implement the work. And the plan is how are you going to transition a, a part-time person? 
The plan shall include the resume of the key personnel, right? The resume must show sufficient um, knowledge, skill, experience, et cetera, for nursing. Contractor approach must also meet the requirements identified in the statement of work. Okay. So they're saying a plan to implement the work and a resume. Okay. So this could be like a staffing plan and a resume or a transition plan and a resume. Okay. Something like that's not going to be too far off from what's going to be considered uh, acceptable. Pricing provide a fixed hourly rate price in accordance with the requested price schedule structure. And that's going to be in that table that we already looked at. And then this is due in a couple of days. So arguably, this is not a big proposal. If this is something you, I would not encourage it, but this is due in two days. Uh, what time? Well, it's on Thursday, May 18th, 16th, 17th, 18th. That's okay. I'm totally off. Today's a Tuesday. Today's not Monday. So yeah, Thursday. Um, so again, not a lot of time. Wouldn't be hard if you have a resume or you had the perfect person for this. Also, there could be a case made that there's an incumbent already doing this. And then you offer the incumbent the right of first refusal to keep their job instead of displacing the worker, at which point in time, you wouldn't even be providing a person, you would just basically be doing the payroll. And um, that's why they want to see the transition plan as well, or the the, the plan of work. Um, we don't know. And again, I, I don't see I don't see that there's like a Q&A posted, is there an incumbent, all that sort of thing. Probably too late to ask contracting, uh, but all things that you would want to do in a perfect world. Evaluation. Technical approach is just, they're literally repeating um, what they already told us. So they're say this is going to be most advantageous to the government price and other factors considered the following factors shall be used. Okay. So it's not reading lowest price. It's reading most advantageous. The price is going to be evaluated for price reasonableness. So it's, it's likely, I don't know. We don't know. I can't wait too much into this. It's likely that the resume is going to be pass fail. They're going to look at the price, but they don't want somebody in here who's not going to perform well. So that bar for checking the resume box, um, it may be a bit higher than what we normally see because that is where that most advantageous thing comes in for the government, if that makes any sense, right? So you kind of got to read this and, and see what their strategy is based on reading this. And then when it comes to you making a qualified bid, no bid decision, do I want to go after this? You have to be asking yourself the same question. Hey, if this is the game for this, if this is how the government is going to be awarding this particular contract, because everybody's different, then is this a game that I want to play? Is this a game that I can play and I think I can win, right? Am I going to have a good resume? Do I have a good you know, staffing plan? Um, and then is my pricing going to be competitive, right? That's how these read. And if you have good answers to those questions, then, okay, like, let's go. And you see, we've been working on this for less than 10 minutes and we're already getting to the nitty gritty. This is stuff I know it's going to take you guys time uh, to get to being able to have these conversations with yourself or with your team, hopefully eventually at least. Um, but this is the, this is the art and the science of it. You want to be able to do this because there's opportunity costs to everything. And if you're not doing this and you just go all in, and you, you stood no chance, and it was obvious you stood no chance, or you, st you stood very little chance, um, then it's much better to take your time, your time is so precious, invest it in something else where you have better answers to those questions. And then that will make you more likely to learn and, and win as you play this government contracting game over the next 12 months, because that is what our realistic expectations should be. Does that make sense? So I'm going to try to kind of wrap this one up because I think that's mostly all the important stuff. We do have a wage determination and a scope of work. We'll just glance at this really quickly for good faith. This is three pages. And then we're going to come uh, bounce back in the chat. So only three pages. Giving us some hours of the facility. Repeating, you know, some of the information that we've already seen not to exceed 2080. And then the specific services, right? So if you're recruiting, if you're hiring, these are the things that is their job, right? Like this is the conversation. So you shall provide the medical personnel and medical equipment necessary to provide the services. Okay, so equipment, that's kind of the first time that hit us. We would want to dig more into that. You shall provide the audiometer, stethoscope, blood pressure cuffs, vision charts and scales. So you're looking for a nurse that has this equipment, right? Changes things maybe a little bit, maybe not, maybe. 
You're also providing preventative health educational training, providing medical referrals for students when necessary, um, providing medical expertise and triage to students um, and make appointments with students. Also working closely with this position is working closely with the Director of Student Affairs on record keeping to ensure compliance and privacy of those records. And then due to the sensitivity, obviously, of medical records and privacy, there has to be designated or the contractor is designated as the keeper of record on these on these files. OK, so they're putting that responsibility on your side of the fence, not theirs. And then more specifically, I guess that's more of the upfront stuff, but then they're saying services more specifically, um, health plans, screening, immunization records, uh, vision, uh, hearing, you know, some of more of the specific stuff. Educational, educational health trainings on diabetes, birth control, right? This is two students. Um, so you kind of get the idea, right? COVID services. So we can easily kind of like piece that together. But if this is something you're going after, you would certainly want to go line by line with that stuff. That's pretty important. Let's see what's going on in the chat. Um, e. Allen says, I started a business in 2016 to sell to the government. I thought I could uh, sell scrap metal to the government. No luck there. Yeah, probably not. So I would like to restructure my business to be a consultant. Um, so I'm not sure if you're going to be like a GovCon consultant where you do what I do, or you're trying to offer consulting services to U.S. federal government agencies. Two very different things. Um, one is probably more likely than the other. Um, Princess Lizzie says, thank you. Very easy to follow. Thank you for that uh, feedback. Um, try to make it as easy to follow as possible. So thank you for letting me know that. What's going on, Rick? Triple seven, triple eight on Unison. The buyer, the buyers have the target amount they want to pay. Will the buyers go above their target price? Um, not an expert in Unison. We do sam.gov. Uh, unlikely. And even if they did, it's very likely that someone is going to be under that price. So it's not just about what their budget is; it's about what your competition is going to come in at. Um, that's going to dictate where you're going to fall in the chips. So I would get kind of like put more emphasis on what are your competitors doing to help uh, kind of determine where you should be. NWAMS been running tech companies, creating software for 12 years. Nice. New to GovCon going for the 541 NICs. Have you ever seen a small business win a tech contract that is not a total small business set aside? Oh, for sure. I've seen women owned small business set asides, 8A set asides, um, all of the set asides really tech, technology contracts it's pretty wide and diverse so uh, yeah definitely um that's not total small business I, I i wonder i wonder what's the meaning behind the question why not total small business are you saying that you're not a small business because your company is large um if so there's also many full and open contracts as well that are not set aside for small business too, because they're because they're you know twenty million dollar plus contracts. Thank you for your thorough explanations from Kay. You're so welcome. Um, Biz Champ, can anyone on can anyone bid on Indian Health Services uh, so IHS contracts? Um, technically yes, but we do see with those contracts it's like a pecking order. So Indian companies, and then they'll they'll give a list of the different you know set aside the different criteria where they have preference. So if you are again, doing bid, no bids, and you're just at the very bottom of that preference, like a total small business, and you're not in any other programs that are, you know, what they're looking for as a preference, you have to seriously take that into consideration on if you want to bid on that, or if there's something that you are less restricted on that you could go bid on instead. Um, so I, I greatly understand that question. Um, one, again, check where you are in the pecking order. Two, if you've got nothing else to bid on, okay. But if there's something else that's a better fit, you got to weigh the odds. We got Kay Joseph. Good morning. Good morning. Rodney Ford, is it is it advisable to use chat GBT to create an initial draft of a response to proposal? I would not say so because, Rodney, um, chat GPT, which I have no... I mean, I know as much about it as everybody else does. Uh, every bit is different. Every bit is unique. Um, so you just want to be wary of using some sort of generic template. Uh, and and again, with this question, it, you know, why would we ask this question? 
want to make sure I have the word in the exact an initial draft of a response. So why would we be asking about an initial draft of a response? Um, we would probably be asking that if we don't have one or we're not confident in ourselves to have one. So we would rather rely on a tool to do it for us so that we quote unquote know that we're doing it right. Okay. Um, that's likely some of the thoughts behind this question. So instead of talking about chat GPT, let's just talk about our improving our own skill set, our own ability and our own confidence in doing a initial draft ourselves, right? How do you do initial draft? You read the solicitation, everything spawns from reading, which is why this entire show is focused on reading. Because if I were to do outlining, if I were to be doing proposal stuff um, on the show live with you guys, first off, it would be very misleading because every business is different. And then you'd try to copy me and then you would be non-compliant. So I can't do that. I can't do that with you guys. Um, and then if you don't know how to read, you're not going to be able to do those subsequent steps on your own. So you have to walk before you can run. So the whole show is built around walking. So what we do here, for example, if you pay attention, um, like the last bit that we just did, we focus on the instruction offers and evaluation factors. We talked about the resume. We talked about the transition plan. We talked about the pricing. We showed the pricing cleanse, right? Those are all the things that are required in your response. So if you're struggling to create an initial draft, that's what your initial draft should be based around. So, okay, open Word, get a cover page, get a cover letter, insert a, you know, a, an automated table of contents, right? And then we use these things as placeholders. So uh, staffing plan, we know we need that. Cool. Put that in there, you know, heading one, heading two, whatever. Next one, a resume. Okay, heading one, heading two, right? Um, pricing table. Cool. Put the pricing table in there. Now we know we also have some forms. So we also saw the pricing claims that were needed. There may have been some reps and certs in there as separate forms that were needed as well. So we know we have a couple of, of those things uh, as well. Also, SF 1449 form needs to be print date and signed. Okay, we have we have these forms. Um, that's about it for the last bid, more of a quote that we looked at. So when it comes to doing initial draft, we just kind of work backwards from that. And I just literally walked you through an invisible like page by page thing. That would be an initial draft. Then you just go and you start plugging and chugging. You start filling it out. Well, you know you're putting your resume in, you're building a plan, you're getting pricing, and then you're putting in some preliminary numbers. Um, you're filling out a cover letter, a cover page, you're updating your table of contents um, automatically just by clicking the button to reflect all those additional meat that you're plugging in. And then before you know it, you're 70, 80% done. Like that's literally the creation process, but you can't do any of that without reading and knowing what this stuff means. Again, what this whole show is built around, because if you can do this, you can do all the rest of it. It's the repetition. That's why we do this every single week. Uh, it builds your confidence in the reading. You, you're sure of what you're reading or any gaps you have, you have confidence to reach out to contracting and ask the questions. And then you get the information that way. And then you proceed. Or if you still don't have it, you say, screw it. This still doesn't make sense. It's too much of a risk. I'm going to move on to the next one. You know, like we are empowered to make those decisions and we need to feel good about those in either direction that we go. So instead of relying on something like ChatGPT, Let's build our own skill set. Let's dig our heels in and learn this stuff. And it's literally why I try to showcase, you know, four or five bids every single week um, to, to put these nails in and get this stuff down so that you can take those next steps forward. So I think that was hopefully a helpful soapbox. No, it was a totally like a five minute, uh, wasn't even a rant. It was more of like a, a training example, but hopefully it was helpful. All right, guys, let's go ahead and check out our second bid and then we'll come back to our chat. So bid number two, custodial services, Limestone, Maine, DFAS. DFAS, uh, Defense Finance and Accounting Service. Again, custodial. This isn't due until June 12th. So you got just under a month on this. Total small business set aside, janitorial NAICS code 561720, Limestone, Maine. We've got a little bit here in the description. The referencing quotations, RFQ. In terms of attachments, we have RFQ. Probably going to be our solicitation doc here. Um, PWS, square footage, performance summary, scheduling charts, schedule of items. So this may be pricing, past performance, and then wage termination. So let's start with what appears to be our solicitation doc on this one 29 pages we're literally we're, we're hit on page one of 
what they want from us. Instructions. The first and second attachment represent the vendor's response to factors one and two. Okay, well, we know there's factors one and two. The first page of each attachment shall include the date, the vendor's name, address, cage code, yada, yada, yada. Okay, cool. Like these are little tripwires. If you don't do this, you could literally be found to be non-compliant and they can throw your proposal away. So if you're not using minimum of 12 point font, they can throw you away. Okay. They're saying first page, they're saying factor one, they're saying factor two. First page, cover letter listing. The, again, everything we just said, show the, the name, the address, the cage code. Okay. So they want a cover letter. That's maximum one page, page limit, one page. Then after that, they want factor one passive form. It's limited to five pages. Then after that, factor two price limited to four pages. So this whole thing shall not exceed 10 pages based off of this little table that they gave us. Gives us a lot of, um, I guess, direction and, and guides. We need to know more still, but it's a good start. Four passive formats, five pages, provide a list of no more than three of your most recent relevant contracts. Only recent and relevant contracts will be evaluated, okay? Recent, relevant, we talk a lot about that. What is recent within the last few years? Uh, relevant means, you know, people are wanting to go on Unison. I'll sell, I'll sell like, I'll win a contract to like provide some goods and then I'll transition to services that way because I'm too scared to get into SAM.gov right away or services right away. Okay, well, that's gonna be a problem if you're trying to build past performance because it's when they're asking for relevant past performance, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be relevant. Okay, providing my, you know, infamous example of road salt is not going to help when a janitorial services contract necessarily because it's not relevant past performance. Makes sense for contracts to do, 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 do. and they give their own definition here. So feel free to read it um, on your own, but they want this information for each of those three. Okay. And this does not have to be government contracts. doesn't have to be city, state, local, federal. This can be commercial B2B what have you. Okay. It can be subcontractor past performance up to you. Um, and it, they have also attached PPQs to so past performance questionnaires. So these will mirror the past performances that you are listing here. So it should be for obviously the same jobs. And what you're going to do is provide these PPQs to the customers. Okay. You don't get to fill out your own report card. Your customers have to fill it out. And then the customer typically will send it directly to contracting. Again, you don't get to fill out your own report card. So that's how PPQs work. And so that's factor one, pass performance. Factor two, price. Okay, firm fixed price, base and option year periods. Uh, didn't see those yet, so we'll be looking for that. Evaluation. It tends to evaluate awards based on vendor's pass performance and price. They are saying what represents the best value, but they can reject if it's not in the public interest. They also are able to do other than lowest price that also goes along with the best value, right? So it's probably not gonna be the lowest price on this, it's gonna be the best value. So they are looking, so the past performance, we see a lot of um, like pass fails. This is not pass fail. This is an example of them actually rating your past performance by very relevant, relevant, somewhat relevant, or not relevant. Remember, if you don't have past performance, you get a neutral rating. So you don't want to be not relevant by giving them past performance that's not even relevant. Just don't put anything, right? And you'll get neutral. Um, doesn't mean you're going to win or be com competitive, but you're not going to get a negative rating on past performance. They'll have to refer to the other factors. See, it says here, contractors with no relevant past performance shall receive the rating of new, neutral confidence. Okay, so there you go. Price, they're looking for price reasonableness as always. I wanna know what the period is for this. They kind of just hit us all that, with all that like right out of the gate, which was, which was great. Just going through some uh, reps and certs and clauses. We'll probably have to refer to our other attachments. So we do have a statement of work I'm gonna peek at really quickly. I 
And this is, how many pages is this? Six pages, is that right? Okay. So they're talking about the, uh, the duties, very, you know, trash removal, um, you pretty much know for the most part what you're getting into with a janitorial contract thing is it can they can be hard to price they they can be uh easily overbid shampooing the carpet restroom cleaning glass cleaning stripping and waxing the floors clean workstation spot cleaning cafeteria breakout sessions okay so it gives you a good idea of the facility itself. They are giving us some volume. Um, like they're saying daily, monthly, and weekly of surface cleanings. So you're going to have for the daily, like you're going to have somebody out there every day. but I was looking for something more of a, a period. But I think we have a pricing table schedule items. And maybe that will be more insightful. Okay, and indeed it somewhat is. So this looks like a base plus four, okay? So five years. We don't necessarily know when it's gonna kick off, but this does help me out quite a bit. Um, they just want a, a price per month for this, all like an all-in price. So you do want to price those things out uh, as you need to separately. Or if you're working with a subjugated quote, probably make sure that all those line items are being covered. And then you're going to aggregate those totals and um, give them one monthly price. And then don't forget like a you know price escalation year on year for these four or five year contracts. Um, the price in year five really for services should never be the same as year one. Um, just because of inflation and prices are always going up. And if they're not, something's terribly wrong with our economy, right? I mean, don't get me started, right? But you know what I mean? <laughs> we do have square footage. Uh, see if they give us a nice map here or anything like that. We could always like go into Google Maps, which I would highly recommend that you do. Um, and again, using these square footage, there's two floors, uh, total of 113,000 square feet, so you know not not a small not a small facility so maybe not something bad to go after i'm not seeing any red flags uh would want to dive into this more but uh yeah not bad like really really not not terrible whatsoever um pretty straightforward pricing past performance not a not a killer proposal or anything like that could make it more competitive, but you know, they're not going lowest price. It doesn't look like on this. So for those of you who, who tend to overbid and you tend to um, lose contracts because your price was way off, try going after best value contracts, contracts that are not lowest price. All right. Mike says, I wanna focus on one location one location set aside contracts under my category and my NICs. Uh, I want to focus on there's a few other comments here. I want to focus on number one, locating set aside contracts. Got it. Locating set aside contracts under my NICs. Got it. And then two, government agencies wanting to renew their subscriptions. I would need coaching on how to propose and how to be more competitive so I can land on these contracts. So yeah, if you're going to be doing it's like software subscriptions. I mean, you're just going to be getting a price from the whoever, uh, whoever creates the software and issues the licenses. And you're going to be competing. The name of that game is just going to be like, who's going to put the lowest margin on. So if, if you want your whole focus to be on competing based on who's going to put the lowest margin on, um, you could probably already start to feel like how that will go for you. So just keep that in mind. If it's something you want to get started out with to get some experience, for sure, but I would set your expectations in accordance with if you're going 
with what I'm saying. You're going to be going after contracts where the winner is going to be whoever puts the least amount of margin on these, these licenses. Okay. So set your expectations there, meaning don't set them very high. Uh, so like I said, th there's other things to gain out besides winning experience, confidence, systems, even potential relationships with contracting officers, right? These are all things that are important. So those are things to consider if that's the route you want to take. Those could all be wins. Um, but just, again, know that you, even if you are winning, uh, the margins are not going to necessarily be be there. And, and that can be okay. But again, just know like the game you're playing and what you're trying to get out of it and set your expectations. So if your expectations are like, oh, I need to, you know, make $500,000 my first year doing that, you're just going to be way, like way off, way off, unless it's some massive contract. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, did I miss an earlier one? To clarify, I'm a small business, but I wanted to ask if it's realistic for a small business to compete on full and open contracts. And when no, it's not really realistic uh, for smalls to compete in full and open just other large companies are going to have grander scale much better past performance their pricing's going to be dialed in although they will have more overhead uh, but typically a contract being set aside or not being set aside a country being full and open they're doing that be because it wasn't there wasn't confidence that small businesses could satisfy it Otherwise, PCRs will be like banging on their doors saying this needs to be set aside for small businesses, right? You can't set this, you know, open for full and open because they know once it goes full and open, it's very, very unlikely for smalls to compete on contracts that are full and open. Now, there is something to be said that these big companies that exist in the full and open pool don't want to bother, you know, with, you know, a small contract that's full and open. And so it may go unseen or whatever, or, or, or unbothered with, but that just comes back to that same point of, well, if that's the case and it is quote unquote small enough, it should just be set aside for small business. Right. And so that's why we don't see a whole lot of that. It's like, if it's full and open, usually larges are doing it or you're teaming with a large, right. Uh, Cause even small business contracts can be quite relatively large, you know, with the space that we're in, you know, quite, quite large, you know, a problem to see $10 million contracts and things like that. So I would just, I guess I would keep that, keep that in mind. Biz champ. Thank you. I also enjoy your lives. Very educational. Thank you so much. And I'm glad that they're helpful. All right going on cz trucking from florida good to see you john novar from miami a big team member good to see you as always john mike Oliveira, do i have software i do not have software i wish i did um i just don't have those type of connections uh but i it's my number one desire is to somehow create a, a software to tie everything together like a proposal management software maybe um connecting subs to prime software uh or just some sort of an executive dashboard pipeline management thing that actually makes sense versus those very, very expensive other options that seem to just want to like paint a really pretty picture with win ratios and say, oh, our pipeline's got $20 million in it this year. And, you know, it's just highly inaccurate, right? Or, or, or the way that it's used, uh, it, I should say, the way that it's abused by small to mid-sized GovCons. Um, these people, they, they get in to the organization and they use the software to basically prove their jobs to their boss when well, they come in the meeting and they do the, the PowerPoint and they pull up the software. It's like, Hey, based on our projections, this is okay. I used to go through that all the time. And it's what a lot of small and mid-sized GovCons do and use never found it useful. Um, my, my attitude and my chip on the shoulder. And even though I was much younger at the time, but, the chip is still obviously very much there is, okay, you do that. I'll go use the time that you do that to go out and win something. You know what I'm saying? So 
that's why I'm so passionate about being in the space of going from zero to one, zero to five, zero to 10. Uh, it's basically once the company is small and small is not small. Okay. Like small is not one person. Okay. One person is like solopreneur. Like it's not even a small business. It's too small to even be considered a small business in certain terms. Um, so when I say small business, you know, five employees, 10 employees, 20 employees, 30 employees, like that's really not small. And it's certainly not small for most people on this channel or in, for in this space that are getting out. Right. So when a company even becomes that size of a small, these people get put in positions and in place and it almost becomes like a mental masturbation for the lack of a better phrase of, Oh my God, we got all these contracts, right? Like, or, or we're, we're going to be going after all these contracts or look at our pipeline or look at our, our win ratios. Um, it's, it's often very far off from what ends up happening by the end of that period. And then there's all these changes and there's all these things. And it's just like, what's the point at a certain stage? What's the point? I get as this as the company grows much larger and you know accountants and everybody wants to start to have some sort of forecast of what's going on with the company uh, etc um because people's jobs depend on it. there's much more employees supporting this but give me a break 10 20 30 employees you do not need that stuff uh, you don't need it at all and you certainly don't need it if you're a team of one two or three that's a very specific type of software that i'm referring to there are other type of software that exist like or, or they don't even exist that I would love to like be able to create, for example, because I know how helpful they would be. Just um, I'm sure it's out there, but it's just not dialed into GovCon. It's it's for like other, you know, there's lots of proposal management software and stuff like that. And there may be one or two that exist in the GovCon space, but you know, not the way that that I see it, not in my vision. Um, uh, Miss Jones, I have janitorial business. So you say go after best value, not lowest price. I'm not saying I'm not saying that. I said if you are bidding on contracts and you're constantly overbidding them in the janitorial space, consider looking at best value contracts. To be clear, um, I have not bid on any contract as of yet, only because I wasn't sure on how to price them. So if you're not sure how to price them, I would ask you. You said you have a janitorial business, so there, there's something there's something amiss there. If you have a janitorial business and you don't know how to bid janitorial contracts, there's just some sort of logical chunk missing. Um, so when you say I have a janitorial business, that could mean, hey, I just created a, a brand new business. We've done zero dollars in revenue and I set it up with janitorial NAICS codes and now I wanna go after janitorial stuff. If that's what you're saying a janitorial business, okay, that's a much more clear picture. Um, and that would also make sense as to why you don't know how to price janitorial contracts. Um, question becomes, are you self-performing? Are you going to be working with subs? So how are you going to be fulfilling the contract? Because if you're self-performing it, right, you, you kind of need to know that. If you were going to be relying on subs, the subs do know that because they are established janitorial businesses and you want to make sure you're getting multiple quotes, right? Um, so there's a couple of like questions, a couple of things to like line out there. And I'm sure that you have answers to those. Um, I just don't have those answers. So things to like things to consider, but if you're going to be self-performing it, that means you're going to be working with employees, whether it's W2 or 1099, you're going to be working with employees. So you have to know what to pay them, right? So that's a big part of your pricing and then any overhead GNA profit, right? And then employer payroll costs and all that sort of stuff that all gets calculated into your pricing. Um, don't do crazy margins for profit. I mean, you can go 10, 20, 25, maybe 30, 30 might not be competitive at all. Um, maybe 10 to 20 to be competitive. So put all that into a formula, right? And that's how you're going to be pricing. If you're going to be uh, self performing the work and also get with your accountant, um, to make sure you have those numbers correct. So just some some initial thoughts on that. What else do we have going on here for our next vid for today? Alarm system monitoring for Grand Teton National Park. Teton, Teton, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, May 31st, due date, small business set aside, security system services, NAICS code 561621. For documents, we have a solic uh, solicitation doc, wage determination, and a statement of work. So we'll look at the solicitation doc first. Uh, 
Okie doke. Um, so as a 4049 form, initially hit with some press and cleanse on the form once again. So we are seeing what appears to be a base period. Yes, base period. Kicking off August 1st and going through the end of July next year. And then we're seeing option one, two, three. So base plus three, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 2027. So base plus three. Again, this is for alarm monitoring, alarm system monitoring. Our award selection process is price, technical, and then past performance, past experience. For the technical, uh, the technical is the factual documents of the firm's ability to meet the, spec meet the specs. Okay, I don't know exactly what that means because they're not really telling us. So we'll keep our eyes out to see if they're gonna be more specific. And then for a prior experience, <laughs> they love this, this word factual. Prior experience is the factual documentation or narrative of a firm's experience, qualifications and capability, along with providing two examples of your most recent projects completed within the last five years. Okay. So your technical, factual documentation of your ability to meet the specs, okay, says nothing. Um, prior experience, they're telling us more factual documentation plus two, two work examples, two recent projects. It tells us nothing plus two projects. When I say it tells us nothing, it's it's pretty much like the same thing when they're saying you must be able to complete everything when this in the statement of work, right? But then, oh, hey, don't parrot the statement of work back to us. That's contracting off, contracting is number one piece of feedback. Don't just parrot it back to us. Well, then don't say what you're saying because the reason you keep getting that is because you give us something more specific, ask better questions, get better answers, right? So don't just give us some ger generic fluff, no thought uh, behind uh criteria and then and then complain when that's what you get back from all the bidders on a job okay it's like it's, it's like what you put in you get out if you want better better bids uh put in a better better bid sheet um so instruction to offer is quotes must be in accordance with and in the order detailed in the section um so solicitation doc amendments projects remember those two projects and they want those uh to be brief description and the point of contact pretty straightforward we do have a pricing table here for those base one two and three option periods total four-year contract it's gonna be based on months so they do want that unit price of one month and then total months for each of these and this is alarm monitoring so they're breaking it down by fire intrusion and elevator phone uh sub cleanse or sub, sub line items for each of these periods. You'll want to fill out this core data, no biggie. <clears throat> they are saying here, see how they snuck this in here? Like, not what we typically see or the way that we typically see it. <clears throat> But they have the evaluation. Government will award a contract resulting from this. That's most advantageous. Price and other factors considered. The following factors will be used. Price, technical, and prior experience. So the same things that they gave us, uh, requested from us for the proposal. At least that is in a line uh, with how it's going to be evaluated. So I'm happy to see that. Because that's how it should, I mean, that's how it should be every time. You would think uh, that it would be that way, but it's not always that way. They may say, we want this in a proposal, then we're gonna evaluate you on something totally different. Okay. So some, you know, some good information there. We have a wage determination and then just a statement of work. So that is essentially what we're gonna get in terms of the, the nitty gritty requirements, but we do have the statement of work. Again, this is base plus three. This is only a few pages long. Few details. There are 21 a total of 21 alarm panels and two phones. The elevators reside in the same building as Alarm One. 
the alarm one panel. There is one location that utilizes two panels for fire and intrusion. All other panels reside um, and something something like this highly encourage a site visit. <clears throat> Some of these details are helpful, but you're likely going to be using a quote on this. You're going to be doing a, um, you know, a legal middleman on this more than likely. You're going to want the sub to see the layout for this. The sub is going to have questions. And then when they get these answered, they're going to be able to give you a, a very accurate quote, but they just need to get that information up front first. Um, Andrew, I just created a business and I plan to work exclusively, exclusively with subs. That's okay. Where do I begin? Need help with identifying contracts and bidding. So Andrew, number one, if you're taking notes, understand legal middlemaning. So understand LOS, limitations on subcontracting. Understand those, those situations where you can exclusively use subs and those situations where you cannot exclusively use subs because there is no one fit all as many people, others in the space will say, hey, just sub it out. Okay, that's dangerous. People go to jail for that. Um, some people say I'm fear mongering, but I mean, go read the articles. Like I have a number of videos where I link up all the articles of the cases, case studies where a company got busted. They go to jail for doing exactly that, just subbing the whole thing out. So there's instances where you can do that. And that's totally fine. It's what I call legal middle manning. So you want to inform and educate yourself. And you also need to learn what not to do so that you can identify if you're doing something that you shouldn't do. Okay, so that's clearly step number one. Um, where to begin? Learn that. Um, then need help with identifying contracts and bidding. There's a whole lot that goes into that. What are you going to be going after? Um, I recommend an umbrella approach. If you have no idea what you want to go after, if you're not like pulling on any previous business businesses that you have or business experience or anything, you're just like, I could go after anything. So you're just like in the middle of the ocean and you don't have, or the, the desert, whatever. Um, you don't have any compass. You don't know what you want to go after. You need to figure that out. Step number two, like, what do you want to go after? If you're just going to do everything, you're, you're going to do nothing. So you want to create some limits. The approach I recommend is an umbrella approach where you pick two, three, maybe four complementary services that are not so far and different from each other. Like we're not doing landscaping and then providing Catholic priests, you know, like we're not, it's got to be more, more similar than that. And then you, you tie them together with, with the, umbrella approach, professional services, environmental, you know, groundskeeping, maintenance, base ops. Um, I give some examples on some of my other videos, but as, as your second step, you, you want to reduce, not be so narrow and niche where you just pick one thing. Cause that's a problem too. It's like Goldilocks. It's the Goldilocks problem. Okay. Mine's too hot. Mine's too cold. This is just right. This is what you need to do. You can't go after too many bids. You can't go after too few bids. You have to go after a just right amount. That's gonna give you enough bids to go after year round and keeping them somewhat similar and complementary to each other. It's gonna get you to learn a particular umbrella, a particular industry or related industries so that when you're bidding on these, you're gonna, your, your, your knowledge is gonna stack. Uh, your information of the industry is going to stack versus if you're doing this and this and this people say hey derek i did 10 bids and i didn't win you just say to play the numbers game yeah well play the numbers game is, is part of it it's like saying you have to practice you have to practice anything that's not something i'm saying that's just the rule of the universe if you don't do it enough you don't get the volume and the reps in you're, you're never going to get better but if you're like trying to learn five different instruments at the same time you're not going to get better at any of them even if you practice for like six months or maybe you'll get a tiny bit better then you're going to say, what am I doing wrong? I'm practicing every day. Well, you're, you're still too unfocused. So you need to learn, you know, one instrument at a time for instruments. But for this, arguably, we do two, three or four. And that's what we call the umbrella. That way, when you start putting those repetitions in, it does start to stack. You do start to see the similarities between your industries. And you can't do that if you're just doing anything and everything across the board. Okay, it's still too, too wide. So imagine, you know, take any of those examples if you want. The Goldilocks thing or learning an instrument or, or whatever. Um, it's the same for government contracting. So step number two, after you learn what's legal and not legal, then you have to put some work in to identify what the just right umbrella approach is going to look like for your business. And then after that bidding, it, it's just mechanical, right? Read, outline, price, proposal writing and forms, and then a proper review and submission. So like those, those are the five steps to bidding. 
Okay. I teach those, but you can learn those, write them down, read the solicitation. That's what we do on Sam Neco bids a lot. Based on reading the solicitation, build an outline. And we talked about that earlier. Use the instruction offers and evaluation factor sections as the headings in the order that they're giving you. And then, and then you plug and chug, right? Um, get your pricing going. The proposal is more of the chug and plug piece and the government forms, you know, print and date and sign the SF 1449 form, fill out the Excel pricing sheets that they give you, fill out those pricing cleans, reps and certs. Um, we talked about PPQ, send those to, you know, to the, um, your, your customers in the past and have them send the PPQs directly to the government, right? These are all the government forms and you don't go, what's the rule for forms? We don't go searching for forms. We only fill out the forms that are given to us. So don't let forms freak you out. They'll, they'll be in attachments or they won't. If they're not, don't worry about it. If they're there, then you can ask questions or just, you know, go off some of the tips that I'm giving you. Right. And then do a proper review. How do you do a proper review before you submit to contracting? You line up those evaluation factors, those instruction to offers points, you line those up line by line with what your proposal says. Your proposal should be no more, no less, no fluff, no BS, literally what they've asked for in the order that they've asked it for. And if they want separate volumes or whatever, whatever tripwires they put in there, you give them exactly that, okay? You, you know how to do that through, through reading, right? But you already had some of that going because you had your outline going, right? So you did the review and then you submit to contracting. And with submitting, um, you're keeping it short and sweet. You're attaching whatever attachments. You always submit through email. Some people think, how do I submit my bid through sam.gov? You don't submit your bid through sam.gov, okay? You have to submit it to contracting, which is on the bottom of the sam.gov listing description. And their email's right there. You email them, okay? And then at the end of every single submission you have to do, please confirm receipt. And if they don't confirm receipt, you put all this effort in, you don't know if they got it. So then you start calling them. You need to keep bugging them until you get a confirmation of receipt, okay? Because you put in that much effort. And then it's a waiting game. Okay. The rule of thumb is kind of like, wait, like two weeks. And then you can ask for, Hey, is there an anticipated award date? Has an award been made? You just respectively follow up and see. And then in the meantime, you're moving on to the next one. So that's the kind of identifying contracts. And, and well, that's really just the bidding piece. Identifying contracts. It's just that comes part of your umbrella process. So then you can just set up safe searches at sam.gov based on those NAICS codes, PSE codes and keywords that are a match for your umbrella services. And then you just put those searches on, on automate. So then you get an email every single day. You can learn to do quick bid, no bids. Okay. This is good. This is good. This is not, you know, the due date is too soon. The set aside precludes me. Um, I don't think I get quotes for this, you know, whatever it is, you develop that criteria, uh, that makes you easy, easier to bid, no bid. And then you go into those and like, oh, hey, they want like stellar past performance. I don't have it. I'm not going to play that game. Um, not going to bid. And then you find the ones where you think, okay, I have a halfway decent chance. Then you move forward with that. And then you go through those five steps of the bidding process that we just laid out. Literally telling you exactly what, what to do, telling everybody exactly what you need to do. The problem with it is it's not sexy at all. It's hard for the industry to teach that it's hard for the industry to monetize that. Cause if you just do that, you will start getting traction. You will fail what you have to do, but you will keep making repetitions, which means you will fail and then you will learn. Therefore you will get better. And then if you do that long enough, you will start winning. Okay. Industry doesn't tell you that because it's hard for them to monetize what's in it for them, for you just to learn this stuff. It's literally what you need to do. That's what we try to, to show you on the channel. Obviously, there's only so much that I can show you. Last one. We got time for one more. Let's do it. Uh, chimney inspection and cleaning. Department of the Interior National Park Services, May 19th. So this is due in just a few days, so not a lot of time at all. Small business set aside. 561790 building and dwellings. This is a BPA. So what's what's a BPA? Burkett, uh, blanket purchase agreement. What do you win when you win a BPA? Nothing. You win no money. What is it? It's a vehicle. Okay. You will have task orders. You will have work coming off of that over time as a vehicle, but the BPA does not just give you something. And a BPA can be single word, can be multiple word. So we don't know if it's just going to be us who gets the ticket to play the game if we win, or if it's a multiple word, multiple people get the golden ticket and they get to play uh, the task order game. Um, we're not sure. Probably like, I'm just going to guess though. It's probably going to be a single award. 
<clears throat> we have a solicitation and a uh, price sheet. That's it. Be too bad. And by the way, guys, if you're getting some value today, uh, you're enjoying this. Some of what I'm telling you is helpful to you. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, smash the like button, uh, hit the notification bell if you want to ask your questions live on future streams. Certainly, um, I appreciate it. And the, the channel appreciates it. I think I just opened this, I'll open it again. Okay, so we have our solicitation document. Rebecca Myers, small business set aside, award selection process, price, technical, prior experience. Is this, I feel like this is the same exact thing we just looked at, but it's not because it's saying <clears throat> up to three BPAs may be awarded to three separate offers, right? So that, that picture I painted to you, I swear I haven't even looked at this. That's kind of opening up this sort of thing. Again, up to three BPAs may be awarded to up to or two, it just says two three separate offers. And then the following evaluation factors will be considered for award. Price, technical, and then prior experience. Price, total evaluated price. I think they have a separate sheet. We'll look at that in a second. Yeah, they're saying attachment three. Next, technical is the, <laughs> is this the same contracting officer? I swear, uh, factual documentation. We're seeing this again. Uh, factual documentation with the ability to meet the specs. Um, I wonder, actually. And then number three, one example. So the last one was two example, two examples. This one is three. I actually have to pull it up. I'm going to pull up the last one. I want to see if it's the same person in contracting on this. That was alarm monitor. It's not okay. It's it's a different person. But uh, anyways, it's us. We don't usually see that language. So I gotta, I gotta have the fun that I can have. <laughs> so anyways, instruction offers. Like even this is the same, it's like the same verbiage, but it's one, again, one project instead of two. Then the core data, just like the last one we looked at. <clears throat> so they're probably gonna sneak in our evaluation thing in here as well. I'm actually just going to control F evaluation. Yeah, there it is. Most advantageous price. That's it. Board will be made. Yeah, it's based on the lowest price offer. Up to three blanket purchase BPAs again, up to three. They're going to calculate that TEP, the total evaluated price. <clears throat> and that's kind of, so we do have, okay. So here's terms and conditions for the BPA. So an initial order will not be under 20 K and will not exceed 130,000. That's per order. There's not necessarily a limit. There could be a limit to orders like something like 20 million or something crazy high. Sometimes we see that. And then a wage termination. I just want to take a peek at this. Okay, now we're real. Now we really are in the old one. <laughs> Let me pull up this one again. Oh, no, we're not. I'm just, I'm just losing my mind. Slowly losing my mind. This is, no, I'm looking for the price sheet. Keep opening the wrong thing. Okay, so here is the price sheet. Giving us cleans, okay, inspections, and cleaning. South rim, north rim, south rim, south rim. Year one, year one, year one, year one. They're giving us like good quantity, 65, 6, 22, 2. So a lot of inspections. But again, they're, they're almost doing, the, because this is a BPA, they're giving this as like sample scenarios. They want to know how much it would be for 
one and then the total price for all of these. And then when you actually win the contract, it will be, it will be another story. The story may not, not be too far off this particular story, but it will be another story. So. JR said, uh, just starting to, do I need Adobe? Um, it's helpful. I mean, you, you do want to have uh, like Word or some sort of Word software to write short proposals in. Um, and then when it comes to editing PDFs, uh, Adobe is obviously the most popular option. Um, I, I like a software called Small PDF. They're a bit cheaper and they're really, really easy to use. So that's kind of uh, the, the recommended software that I use. If contracting does not alert the losing bidders to tell them that they lost, how do we know exactly when are we supposed to reach out to them for a debrief? So you can, um, again, you want to stay on top of them, but it the award would be publicly posted. So you want to be, you want to be following, for example, see this follow button right here. You want to follow anything you're bidding on that way. If the award is publicly posted and publicly made, then if nothing else, you can use that as your trigger to to follow up with them matt myers if an opportunity does not specify an opportunity and or a date to ask questions can you still email the ceo your questions um they're not obligated to answer the questions there is typically a q a deadline if there's not a QA de q a deadline i would highly encourage you to submit those questions in writing if you don't get a response i would follow up and feel free to follow up with a phone call as well um, some people have mixed advice on that. I'm not afraid of the telephone at all. Uh, they may or may not answer. It's very hit or miss. Communication with contracting is always hit or miss, but I always kind of try to do like try to do both because it just improves the overall flow of information. So don't ever hold back if you have questions. If the Q&A deadline is obviously passed, you might be wasting your own time, but if there isn't one in this situation, um, I highly encourage you to just reach out and, and try and give it a shot, especially if it's, if it's like something important that affects the whole outcome of the bid contracting may be, Oh man, like we didn't know and nobody else brought that to our attention. So thank you. We're going to literally extend the due date now. So if there's situations like that, and that's why I'm saying I highly encourage it. Um, Puerto Penasco 602 waiting on my service disabled cert nice from the sba to come sam approved uei cage done congrats yeah sounds like you're almost out of the woods on that and then you'll be good to go that's great is there a way i can see what nicks i have active yeah if you just go to your um go to your sam.gov account check out your entity and you can see all the next codes that are in your account um you don't even have to do it from the edit mode. You can literally just you can like look up your your own company on on sam.gov. There's a few different ways you can do it. Okay, thoughts on lodging solicitations for a beginner? I mean, I don't hate it. I know a number of people who have won their first contracts through a lodging bid. Going to be a bit more competitive because it's not a lot of work. It's mostly you know getting the numbers. Um, but I think it's a great way to get in uh, the game and gain experience. And then from there, you can decide if it's something that you want to keep as part of your umbrella or if it's something that you don't want to keep. But I don't think it's a bad entry point. Grace Johnson, hey, Derek, when you have option years and the criteria is the same as the base year, do you price the option years with the same figures as the base? Uh, so you want to, you know, pricing for government pricing, <clears throat> It's not really a thing. Like it's not government pricing. You know, the only real government pricing thing that there is is the government breakdowns and the way that they would want to see it versus the commercial space. But the government does not want something that's an, a non-fair market price and a non-fair market value. You shouldn't be charging something way different than what would go in the competitive or in the in the commercial space. Um, and and if so, like your offer, it, it's not going to be competitive. So with understanding that. Do prices go up over time in the in the commercial space? Typically, yes, they do because inflation and escalations and supply chain, you know, stuff that we dealt with the last couple of years, all these things affect pricing. And typically, especially if you're going after something that's like three or four option years and you're looking at a four or five year contract, 
yeah, like the price is probably going to be up. So you, you want to try to forecast. And if you're getting pricing from subs, the subs will, you know, be able to forecast what that escalation is. Um, contracting looks for something called price reasonableness. And if you're charging the same thing five years from now, whether it's a service uh, that you're working with a sub for, or, or even the example of like staffing, providing people, right? You're not going to give a, a raise to your employee for five years. You know, employee's going to leave. So in situations like that, where the where it's just flat, contracting is going to be fearful that the price is not balanced. It's unbalanced pricing. It's not reasonable pricing. So you want to mimic the the market, okay? And and the trend for the market is that prices typically go up a little bit year after year, especially after three, four, or five years. <clears throat> As far as insurance with middleman strategy consultant, would you have the sub add your company as a certificate holder? Um, I mean, as your company, you want to have your own general liability insurance, and that will typically cover a lot of contracts anyways. Um, you can have them add you. I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to do with the legalities of that, but I would just say I encourage everybody to have their own general liability insurance for their own business. Do not just rely as a, on a sub to have their own insurance and have your company have no insurance. Matt Myers, thank you so much for the, uh, I believe this is a super, super sticker or super chat. It doesn't tell me, but thank you so much for the contribution to the channel. Not necessarily, but um, certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, so Grace, uh, BPA, it's it's a blanket purchase agreement. <clears throat> so it's it's like a vehicle where you don't necessarily, or where you, you do not, not necessarily, but you do not win like, okay, here's the contract award dollar money value. Instead, it's a vehicle where the government will be issuing task orders or future services off of that you will price in accordance with the pricing that you submitted for the bid that had you win, right? So it's, it's basically a way of getting your pricing upfront to contracting so that when they do have these task orders, these services that are very similar in nature to what you just quoted, you're going to use that same kind of pricing. Almost think about it like a pricing catalog a little bit to move forward with those services based on that, that particular pricing. So it in and of itself, the, the thing, the vehicle isn't a specific like work order, if you will, but it will be the vehicle that, that gets you to those work orders with the government. I, I may not be doing a good job of explaining it. Um, but if you understand task orders, like that's really what it becomes. It's very similar to, well, like an IDIQ. An IDIQ just means um, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. It means the government doesn't know. So they're relying on you to tell them. So there, there, there certainly are IDIQ contracts where you are awarded and then it's that real money, right? So that's what IDIQ means. But you're, but like more like may talks, like multiple, like multiple award task order contracts, single award task order contracts, say talks, just, just task order contracts in general are very similar to like a BPA where what you're, what you're bidding on, what you're pricing based on is more of a scenario or an example. And that example is very similar to what the real task orders are going to be based off of, you know what I'm saying? So it, it's, it's kind of like that for sure. Um, I'm sure most of you guys know, but we're continuing to enroll for our bid team. If you're looking for support on this sort of stuff, feel free to check out my website, GovKid Method. We got two tabs there now. Um, just the whole bid team tab. I got a four minute video for you to watch. So you can check that out at the website. And then we have our, um, our free master class as well. Lots of great resources for getting started in 2023. Highly recommend it. We get so much great feedback on that. So definitely check out GovKidMethod.com um, if you're looking for additional support. And again, we focus in bid team, we focus on, on bidding and winning. So we're learning um, all these systems, all these things that I try to explain, we go into a lot of depth and it's twice a week coaching with, with me. So um, pretty much anything that you, you would need along with the templates and the resources and all that sort of stuff so that you're not reinventing the wheel, um, reading support with legal middlemaning, all that sort of stuff um, we, we cover in there. So if you're somebody who has been on the fence or you've been wanting to do this, but you need support more than what we can do here on the show, that's exactly what Bid Team was created for. So definitely check that out if you are interested. Guys, we're going to go ahead and call it here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Subscribe to the channel. Smash the like button if you got some value today. 
And thank you all for watching. We'll see you all on the next episode of Sam.gov Bids Live. Take care, everybody.